So I often get sent products that I want to review and try out and use on set, but I don't always feel like these products warrant an, an entire video or they're just not that interesting to me to create an entire video over. And so sometimes I just do a kind of setup I get with some friends and I put some stuff together just to try out some stuff. And in this video, we're gonna talk about some of the stuff that's been sent to me recently or some stuff that I've ordered that I wanted to try out and just see how it is to use. So the main things that we're gonna talk about today are the new Godox um, light reflectors. I think they're actually called the Godox No LED or no LED light flow K1 reflectors. Um, they're basically a version of the light bridge reflectors that you've probably seen that cost a lot more money than the Godox. The Godox aren't necessarily cheap. This uh, kit that we're using today costs $2,300, but it's a pretty um, neat new modifier for lighting that we haven't had in the past. It's kind of a new technology that I've never really got to use on set. So it's fun to try that out. Also, Aperture sent me the new Aperture Spotlight Max, which is basically the Leco style mount um, that you can now use on bigger lights like the 600 or 1200. Whereas the old one, you really couldn't use it on those because it's just the intensity of those lights was too much for that. Then also I was shooting, doing some lens tests with the Dulens APO Primes. I'll probably make a full video over these, but might as well talk about them a little bit in this because we were using that for all of our test footage in this video. Something else I tried out for all the behind the scenes is actually shooting on the Canon R7 this time. If you watch my last kind of end of the year video, I talked about a lot of topics in that video. Um, it was kind of a podcast style video. You should go check that out now if you're interested basically on my thoughts of gear and the industry at the end of 2023 and going into 2024. But I talked in that video about the Canon R5C and how I thought it could maybe be a good B camera for me, given that it shoots raw and it's cinema style hybrid, but it also shoots 10 bit and has autofocus and stuff like that for this YouTube format. But I also want to try out the R7 because it's just like so cheap. It oversamples from 7K, gives you autofocus, um, and it's a much smaller camera. It is a super 35 millimeter sensor, but that's not a big deal to me. I have speed boosters and super 35 millimeter lenses. It's not really a factor for me. So that was kind of fun. So I've been using that as the BTS cam just to see how it operates and test that out as well. So thank you, uh, Easton, Drew, and Al for helping me out on this video. Um, it was a lot of fun hanging out with you guys and trying out this stuff. The first thing I wanna talk about is the spotlight mount. It's not something that there's a lot to say about it other than it's really big. It's a big spotlight mount for your big lights. It is a lot nicer, I would say, than the original spotlight mount, just in how it functions. It has like a dual yoke system on it. When you do put in your gobos, which are basically like these little um, cutouts for creating like a tree background or um, foliage in the background or some sort of window slash in the background, before you had to just drop those in manually and just kind of hope that you got them to look straight. Um, but with this, there's actually this kind of gear wheeled um, system inside of it now that you can roll with your thumb and you can reposition that background gobo, which is really nice. I'm really happy that that's now included in the kit. We use the 36 degree lens, um, which the more narrow you get, obviously the tighter the light can get. So like 19 degrees is a pretty tight window. And it's also, I think, ellipsoidal. So it's like kind of more of a oval. And you can obviously get a 50 degree one too, which is a wider one, a wider lens, but we use the 36 degree primarily. And the reason I wanted to try this out with these Godox light flow reflectors is because with the reflectors, you're trying to take all your light and focus it onto one reflector to modify it and you don't want it spreading all over the room. So it was a kind of a perfect scenario for us to try out big lights with the reflectors at the same time. And it worked really well. It, there is something pretty cool with that one too, is you can, which I didn't have with my kit, but you can throw in a diaphragm or an iris, whatever you want to call it, to focus the light much more easier. It just kind of slides in the behind the lens there and it can kind of um, narrow down your spotlight. Um, we didn't have that in the kit to try out, so we had to just kind of use, you know, the flags to do it ourselves, which was totally fine. Really nice piece of kit. I think it's a little bit niche. Like I said, it's if you, if you have the big lights and you need something like that, then, then cool. Um, it is about $1,300, $1,400, so it's fairly pricey for what it is, but it is something that sometimes you just need. Actually, some of the things we're talking about today are kind of those extra things, like these light reflectors. Definitely not something that you're just gonna have always in your kit. They're kind of a special thing they're kind of that extra. Like if you're trying to get that 10% better look on set, these reflectors are really cool for that. Basically the reflectors, let's kind of jump into those real quick. They come in a dump, bunch of different sizes, um, like super small ones like this, all the way up to really big ones like this. We had the kit that basically had like the 20 inch ones, yeah, like a six inch, a 10 inch, and a 20 inch. Really fun. Basically you're trying to focus all your light onto one of these reflectors and it doesn't just reflect like a mirror or like a piece of metal or a shiny board or something like that. What it does is it actually um, focuses your light 
but s spreads it at the same time. I know that sounds kind of backwards, but you're taking all your light and all that intensity and then you're being able to redirect it however you want while giving it um, a different texture to it, a different um, look to it. it. There's like a harsher version and they kind of get softer. They spread more as you get higher up on the number scale, I believe. There's also one that when you shine a light into it, it creates its own kind of little slash. Why I really like these, we were testing these out, we tested them out pretty extensively. Um, I like the quality of light that you get from it. It really feels like it's light from outside. It really makes it like makes your light source feel like the sun. It makes it feel much, much more natural. Like it's reflecting off of something, like it's bouncing around. But what's cool about it is you can control the heck out of it. Like you don't need to set up flags and grids and stuff to control your light. Because it's all coming off of this one panel, Anywhere you point that panel, you're gonna get that same quality of light as it moves. So we tried it as a key light first. We were like, can we take the biggest one we have? You know, it's the softest spread. And can we make it like look good just on a face? And for the most part, it did look pretty good. It's not something I would use for a perfect key light. It's just the source doesn't get quite big enough. But man, if you shoot a light up into that and then shoot that through some diffusion, you're getting a super soft light. Um, but it was fun if you're using it in a kind of window environment where you want to have like light coming through the window and then you want a little key light and you want like maybe the back to be spilling with light too. That's kind of like the setup we did. So if you really want it to look like there's light coming through your windows and it's natural, but you have full control of it all day, I highly, highly recommend this style of modifier. It was really fun to be able to shine it on the background and you can change the spread on it depending on which one you use or just moving it a little bit really changes how the background is affected, but it doesn't, it's not harsh. Like you're just shining a light right on it with a Fresnel or something. Um, it just looks much, much more natural. And for doing it kind of as a key light, we did kind of like use it as like a sidey light, but then we just bounced a little light off the wall on the inside to kind of fill in the face and give more wrap. It was kind of the best of both worlds. You're kind of getting this like almost cove style lighting, right? You're getting this kind of harshness on the edge that looks like the sun is the one, the sun is the only source lighting the room, but then you're filling it a little, filling that in a little bit with your own light. It just looks really nice. We even like kind of use it as like a back edge. What's really handy about them too is they're so small and lightweight and easy to maneuver. You can throw them up like on a boom arm and put them behind someone and then shoot at it. So if you can't get a light somewhere, if you don't have the manpower or uh, maybe the grip power to put a light where you want to put it, you can just put one of these reflectors there and then shoot a light at it. Um, so it just comes in really handy that way. And how they advertise it on their site really is that they kind of advertise it as like, put up one big 1200 or the sun, shoot it at a big reflector, like into your, your set, and then use a bunch of the other reflectors to capture that light and redirect the light in different ways. We tried that a little bit. It doesn't seem as practical as it sounds. You're kind of like, that's really cool. You can just like have one light and then you're doing all this stuff, but you end up having a bunch of stands if you do that, or you're mounting these little reflectors everywhere. But the quality is really cool. It's not just like having a mirror or something like that. So um, there's definitely something really interesting to be said about these. I need to maybe play with them even more, maybe get them on set and really see how they work before I can give like just the full review on them. But they're really interesting, really fun thing to have in the kit. I use like what we're calling gaffer slashes now in the background a lot, uh, where you kind of, you know, slash a line down the back wall or something or during an interview or um, a shot. And these are gonna make it much easier to do that. You could use a spotlight mount instead, but you're getting that really harsh quality when you do that. So if you want something that just looks a little bit more natural, shoot at one of these reflectors first, shoot it at the background, looks really nice. Or if you're going to do a book light, you could make it super soft and shoot it into like a white beadboard. But if you shoot it into one of these, you're gonna get a different type of quality on the skin. Just kind of levels up your cinematography just a little bit, just separates you, just makes you look a little bit more natural, less sourcey, less, it looks less like you lit it. So, you know, generally speaking, the, the bigger the source, the softer it is. But with these, even if you go down to like the little, the little small squares, they still have quite a bit of softness on them. So if you're just trying to light like a little product, but you want it to be semi soft, you can shoot a little light into it and then redirect your reflector onto a small product and it contains that softness in one area. So it's really fun to really have full control of your scene. Like you could, you could direct a few of these at different parts of your scene and really like paint, right? Like you're like, I want to highlight that area. I want to highlight that area. I want to highlight that area. But I want everything else to be dark. Well, these reflectors really give you that control to do that. I could see these being really, really helpful with lighting food. Actually, I just thought of that. I think if I ever do another food shoot, I will be 
for sure using these reflectors the whole time. It's pretty standard to use mirrors on food shoots and that's because of that same reason, controlling it. But this way you get this really nice soft quality the whole time. They're not super heavy. They have these little mounts in the back, these kind of sliding brackets. Um, the whole time though we do, we were talking about, we wish we did have like kind of a ball joint head on it so you can maneuver it much easier. If you put it on a grip head, obviously you can move it up and down. But I do think they should come standard with a ball joint, kind of like the Kino Flows had, um, you know, it's like an actual ball and socket mount. I do wish it had that right out of the box. The case was really nice. They all fit in there really well. They all have different colors on them, so you know which ones you're grabbing. There's even room for more reflectors in the case once you bite the base set. That setup, it has wheels on it, was really, really nice. The case was like, very good and it was like one of those touches that you don't always get when you buy a light or a product like that you don't always get a nice case to go with it this one comes with a very nice case um, and i feel like that that little extra really helps with the price of these things so yeah the other thing we were uh playing with were these do lens lenses these have been like on my radar for a while i've been trying to get in touch with them and try to review them we've had some miscommunication issues so i finally asked b and h if they would loan me some you know i don't know if you guys know that but a lot of these Things that I review on the channel, B and H actually has a partnership with me, and they will send me stuff to to play with for a few weeks, basically, and then I send it back. So I was able to actually get these. They were in stock for just a few weeks on B and H, and these have been really hard to get for the past year. There's been three month waiting windows to get these, but they were randomly a set on B and H, so I I snagged them, and now I believe they're out of stock again. But they should be back soon, I'm sure. These are great. These are like they're they're modern cinema house lenses. They're only like a thousand dollars a piece. You can change the mounts on the back yourself. So these came PL, but I actually swapped to the EF mount on the back. That way I could use it with my speed booster. Um, so I could try them more in that kind of full frame look. Cause they are T2.4 lenses, but a lot of people are saying they're T2.4, but they're kind of like an F2. Um, they're kind of, just a, a, a strange lens like that. I have found that they they just have such nice fall off that you really aren't stressing that they're not super fast. They're fast enough, of course. They come in really fun focal lengths. They're very obscure focal lengths compared to what you're used to, which I really like because they kind of give you that just a different look because of that one reason. Like this one right here is a 58 millimeter versus you know you're normally seeing a 50 or a 55. The one we're shooting on right now is the 43 millimeter, and then they have a 31 millimeter. I think about to come out with like a 21 millimeter or 20 five millimeter and then they have an 85. I was able to test out the 31, the 43 and the 58. The 31 I wasn't able to get an EF mount for so I test that one the least. But it's really cool that you can swap out the mounts yourself. Um, I think it's like 90 bucks you can get another mount. And um, you have both ready to go whenever you need. Like I wanna shoot PL or I wanna shoot EF, just swap it whenever you need. It's six screws, it's very simple. Comes with the shims too, if you need to shim the PL amount to get your back focus better. What's really fun about these, so they're APO, which means um, they're not going to have any chromatic aberration while this is still giving you a vintage look. And if you've heard me talk about lenses a lot on the channel, that's something that I'm always very interested in is, can I get a vintage look without the chromatic aberration that comes along with it? So these will give you that. These are really fun. So at T24, they are going to be kind of sharp, not clinically sharp at all though. They have a really nice fall off and they are sharp only in the way that like there's enough in focus at any given point. So they're really nice for that reason. But the vintage characters I would really say is that when the flare, they like rainbow flare, they're like, they have some pretty wild but unique flares on them. I really like them because they just are different. So for commercial work, I would be really excited to use these. They also will kind of haze out a little bit if the light hits them just right compared to like some modern clinical lenses. And then, you know, normally on some lenses you have what's called cat's eye bokeh on the edges, right? So the closer you get to the edge of a lens, you start to see that bokeh that's normally a circle kind of cat's eye in, you know, has points on either side of it. These kind of have that across the whole image which is interesting because at any given point, your bokeh just looks more unique than a standard lens. Your bokeh is almost never never really circular. Kind of has this anamorphic feel to it. Actually, a lot of people use these and put anamorphic fronts on the front of them in order to get that anamorphic look because they're just really nice lenses. They're really, really well made, have a really nice focus throw on them and the aperture throw, nice caps. I believe they have an 80 OD, but then they have a 72 millimeter thread on them, but just really, really well made. And then the flares are really fun. So we tested those out too. So all the footage is obviously on that. Um, I think the first one we had on the 43 the whole time, and then we switched to the 58 after that. And some of this footage is also shot on an FX6 
off to the side with the same the same lenses. But you're always hearing people talk about lenses and how these are no these are vintage lenses and basically that all, all that means are like vintage style lenses and basically all that means is like they're removing a bunch of the coating. So now they're like flare really crazy and they have low contrast whereas these don't really do that. These are like the most controlled vintage style while actually giving you vintage style characteristics. Whereas I feel like sometimes when they say it's vintage, it really just means they're crappy, which is fine. I'm not totally against that, but these are much different. Like we were shooting with this and I also shot with the tuner on a Sigma right next to it. And they looked wildly different. The tuner is doing much more, it's really degrading the image compared to these where the image looks actually really nice and controlled, but the flare is like nothing you would have out of a modern lens or the bokeh is like nothing you would have of a, out of a modern lens. So very fun. Hard to get still, but highly recommend these. These are like a really good in-between. If you don't wanna to spend too much money on lenses, but you wanna have something that looks really nice and feels really nice, works really well, but has a little bit of character compared to most things on the market, these are definitely the ones you wanna look into. Obviously they cover full frame, obviously they work in Super 35. So I'll probably do some more shooting with these. I might just make some just nice looking images with these and post it. I don't know if I'll just do a full review. I think it's pretty easy to find that sort of stuff online right now. But if you really wanna hear more about these lenses, let me know in the comments below and then maybe I'll make a full review. I also got the Nisi Athenas in. They came in yesterday, so I'll be making a video over those soon. Let me know if you have any questions about those in the comments below. There are other videos online about those already. I'm gonna do my best to kind of just shoot them in a way that I would use them and really give my take on them. So let's take a break before we talk about the Canon R7. And I wanna thank this video's sponsor, which is Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to present your work online. You can start with one of their best-in-class templates or using Squarespace's next-generation web design system, Fluid Engine. You can customize every detail with the reimagined drag-and-drop technology for desktop or mobile. Or maybe you want to start an online store to sell your photography or other products. Squarespace has all the built-in functionality to get one of those up and running quickly. And I've actually been using Squarespace to run my online stores for almost a decade now. And of course, if you're like me, you're probably looking to build a portfolio, which Squarespace has ton of features for that very thing. You can even create private galleries for client work using these tools. So if you're looking for a home for your work, well, you can just do that with Squarespace. Click the link in the description to get 10% off. And I wanna thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Okay, so back. Okay, so the behind the scenes footage, <laughs> all shot with the Canon R7. Um, definitely don't need to make a full video over the Canon R7 in my opinion. I much prefer talking about cinema cameras more than mirrorless style cameras, stuff like this. So I'm just gonna be transparent. I have the last Intel Mac computer that they made <laughs> before they switched to the, um, the M chip. So these new H.265 files that come out of the Sony cameras, come out of the Canon cameras, stuff like that, really wrecked my like my computer. I thought it was just the Canon R5C that was doing that, but this one also did it. This one's cool though. It has a super 35 millimeter sensor or an APS-C sensor. It oversamples from 7K, but it has the autofocus. It has a nice screen on it. It has a viewfinder on it, which is nice. And it can shoot all the flavors of 4K. It is 4K fine, which basically means it, that's the, over, the nice oversampling, but also do 4K where it's doing some more weird compression. Um, I'm not exactly sure what's going on there. But it does have a light compression mode, which I've been using, um, and it makes your file sizes much smaller. They operate on my computer perfectly fine. The image looks pretty much the same. I'm still not super stoked on 10-bit cameras. Sometimes they look really good. I do think the Sonys look really good. I'm just so used to shooting on my Komodo. I'm so used to having the red raw workflow, and I'm, I think I'm just spoiled by it now. So shooting with this, it took me a second to figure out Obviously straight out of the box, the color looks really nice, but it took me a second to figure out ex ex its exposure. Some people comment on the last video talking about Canon log, you definitely need to overexpose it a little bit. So I did do that. I always kind of kept the highlights pretty high. That really helped, that really took away the noise. I wish the autofocus was a little better, but I've always been using some, of, some off brand mount. Like this one has the ND, the Mica ND mount on it. Really handy though. I mean, just roll on the wheel and you have internal ND basically. And I've been using the Sigma 18 to 35. Autofocus worked pretty well. Um, when it's in face mode, it just stays on faces. So when you start to shoot a product, it kind of gets confused. Used. Um, so that's something I would have to figure out. I'm still gonna try it out some more. I'm gonna see, I have two shoots coming up, documentary style shoots coming up, and I'm going to see if I can use this as a B camera. Um, if not, I'm just gonna have to get a second Komodo, guys, and then maybe get another one of these just for YouTube content. Um, it is fun though, just, just to see how things compare to the Komodo. 
Um, I know I've done a lot of tests compared to the Komodo, but I'm, maybe I'll make a whole video over this too, but I've just, Komodo just really has been so good to me. And I really don't feel like there's a lot of competition in this range for it. That being said, we are gonna talk about a few more things on the channel. I'm hoping to get a Blackmagic uh, full frame camera at some point try out. I don't know why I haven't tried that camera out. I just kind of bought into my whole red system and stopped talking about black magic But I know that's what started this channel and a lot of you probably want to hear my thoughts on the black magic camera So we're definitely gonna talk about that and I'm really trying to get my hands on an old red camera I'm trying to buy an old red camera and so we can really talk about the pros and cons of buying an old red camera rather than buying some of the new modern cinema cameras today a few of you were interested in that. Let me know in the comments below if you're really interested in that topic because I'm going out of my way pretty hard to get one of these cameras and own one so I can use it for a while and not just borrow one for a day and try it out. I want to, I've shot on them a lot, but I want to get some new extensive tests with them and really see if it's something that it's makes sense to use long term, even now in 2024, using these cameras that are years and years old. I'm still pretty convinced that the image and the usability of the camera is gonna hold up, and a lot of you might buy into getting an old red camera instead. I mean, I found one, like, for less than four grand, an entire kit with specs that, like, are way better than most cameras these days. So we'll talk about that in a future video. Thanks for watching these videos. I've been doing these for a long time. I've had some ups and downs with these videos and I'm excited to get back into it and make some more videos. So like and subscribe if you haven't already. And I just thank you for your viewership. And until next time guys, I'm Spencer Sakurai. See ya.